It's an exciting time for CDCAL5 Deficiency Disorder, CDD. Research is currently underway to develop new medicines for CDD, including gene therapies. To test new medicines, clinical outcome measures are needed that can identify whether these medicines have worked. The problem? No CDD-specific outcome measures currently exist. Is there work being done to develop these measures? Yes. In 2021, the ICCRN was awarded multi-site validation of biomarkers and core clinical outcome measures for clinical trial readiness in CDKL5 deficiency disorder, an impressive project that is supported by the NIH NINDS. This award was made possible because of the research infrastructure funded by the IFCR, your donation dollars at work. The ICCRN team is following a pipeline of activities in their program of research that will develop and test clinical outcome measures for CDD to prepare for the clinical trials of the future. What does this mean? The ICCRN is getting CDKL5 clinical trial ready, but they cannot do it without us. For the past year, we have asked our CDCAL5 community to be one of 200, one of 200 people needed for the initial phase of this important study. That phase is now complete. The next phase of the study is called the longitudinal phase, and it is now enrolling for families who participated in the initial phase, as well as new families who want to get involved. It's not too late. Listen as the ICCRN principal investigators share an update on the initial phase of the study and learn more about what happens next in the longitudinal phase. I'd like to start by expressing my profound gratitude to the CDKL5 patients, families, parents, other support systems that have helped make the progress we've had to date possible. We have managed to enroll 143 patients into our protocol so far and collect really critical data to help us understand what does CDKL5 look like when we use these standard measures? How well do these measures perform and will they be useful in a clinical trial setting? I know we were aiming for 200 patients, but nobody thought we would even get to 100 at certain stages. And so 143 is really, really good. And we're very proud of the community for coming together and being able to make this possible. 143 turned out to be enough. We've analyzed the data, we've looked at these measures and how they performed, and 143 patients and their data and their contributions allowed us to show that most of our measures performed really well. And we think they will be useful in clinical trials in the future. Congratulations on this accomplishment as a community. Great job, we really appreciate you. That completes our initial phase of the study. We are now transitioning into the longitudinal phase. In order to be successful and really know how to use these measures in a clinical trial setting, we wanna collect data over time. That's what we mean by longitudinal phase. So we're going to repeat collections of these measures with patients and families over the next three years. And we'd like to collect different measures at different frequencies because some of them are more relevant over a shorter frequency, like three months, and other ones over a longer frequency, like six months or a year. In order to do this, we've tried to minimize the burden on families as much as possible. We know that we're asking a lot. In fact, we know we're even asking more than we did in the initial phase of the study. But this is still critical information for us to be able to be ready for clinical trials in the future. In particular, I wanted to make note of the parent surveys, the parent severity assessment and developmental questionnaire. We're gonna ask families to complete these every three months for the next two years once you start. That's because we wanna see how much these change over a relatively short period of time, that three month interval. How much does that natural variation occur 
in the lives of families and patients with CDKL5? And how much of that is a trajectory change over time over those two years? So we need to have some closer uh, measurements. We're also going to do a short period, six months, of more intensive measurements where we're going to actually collect them every month. This is for the same reason. We really want to know how much variability do we see over those uh, shorter intervals of time. But we're not going to make you do every month for the entire time. So we're trying to find a balance so we can get the data we need with the minimal amount of burden. The good news is those surveys are actually a little bit shorter now than they were in the initial phase. The great work that the community did to get us through that initial phase allowed us to shorten some of those surveys because there were extra questions that turned out to not be necessary in order to capture what's going on with patients in a reliable and valid way. So going forward, they'll be a bit shorter, but we are going to ramp up the intensity of what we're asking you to do. And we are very excited to move forward with this. We're very excited that our measures were actually successful and look like they're going to be useful in a clinical trial setting. And that would not be possible without the CDKL5 community, without the International Foundation for CDKL5 Research and all of their support and with all of you. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time, doing the work, showing up for us and helping us to get to better answers and better systems so that when we do get to disease modifying clinical trials, we actually can measure whether or not they're working. Thank you. Hey everybody. Thanks very much for watching and for your interest. I've been asked to tell you a little bit about clinical trial readiness for the longitudinal phase. So it's important when we talk about clinical trial readiness to know exactly what this means because this is really important to you and everybody else that's involved with CDKL5 disorder. The idea is, is that when we start a clinical trial and we're using something that we think is gonna make the symptoms of CDKL5 disorder better, we wanna be able to very specifically measure exactly how much things get better. It's important because we want to measure something that is reproducible and that is something that is meaningful to you. And so when we asked you to participate in the initial phase of our clinical trial readiness project, we wanted to make sure that we were asking the right questions. And so as a result, we asked you a whole lot of questions. And when we did this, we were able to use special statistical methods to figure out which questions we're not, as we say, performing the way that we would want them to. And after all of that work that you went through and we went through to analyze the data, we were able to make the questions that we ask you to fill in, the parts of the exam that we do to make them more efficient, to get at something that's clinically measurable and meaningful. And so that's the important part of the longitudinal phase. Now that we've narrowed down the questions, we've refined them, we've made them as best as we possibly can, we need to make sure that they're now stable for this next part of the longitudinal phase. Thanks very much for participating in this. It's really important to all of us that we get it right when we find something that works to make your loved ones better. Hello, CDKL5 families. My name is Eric Marsh. I'm a child neurologist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and one of the principal investigators of our NIH-funded CDKL5 outcome measure study. First, I'd like to thank anyone who's participated in the study to date for their participation and like to encourage those who've participated to continue to uh, be involved, as well as any other CDKL family to join our study. Specifically today, I want to tell you a little bit about our EEG and evoke potentials component of this study. This is only happening at a few of the sites, but what we're doing is measuring brain waves using a EEG net system. So it's easier to get than your typical EEG. And we're trying to determine whether these brain waves can track with severity and ultimately be used as a marker of change in CDKL5. Over the last two years, we've collected 50 uh, individuals with CDKL5 and have indeed shown that the EEG and parts of the evoked potential can correlate with severity in individuals with CDKL5. 
What we now need to show in the longitudinal phase is that the signals, the brain waves are stable, meaning that if your child is not changing, the brain waves stay the same, and that there's not too much variability from visit to visit. This is important information to get if we're gonna use these as an outcome measure in any clinical trial, whether small molecule or gene-based clinical trial. Just to remind people, the way we're doing this study is using a net-based system, so it's much easier to uh, get placed on than a standard clinical EEG. And the entire procedure takes about an hour of your time in which we'll get some resting baseline EEG followed by showing a visual stimulus and then an auditory stimulus. It's a pretty easy procedure and it's well tolerated by the kids. And as a parent, you could be with your child the entire time. The biomarker EEG portion of the study is available at the Boston, Philadelphia, Denver, and now the Houston CDCAL5 Centers of Excellence sites. Hello, I'm Dr. Jenny Downs, and I'm Head of Child Disability Research at Telethon Kids Institute in Perth, Australia. And I'm Dr. Jacinta Saldaris. Jenny and I are part of the team for the National Institute of Health funded 1 in 200 study for CDKL5 deficiency disorder or CDD. In this video, we will tell you about the video measures in this study, what we have achieved in the first two years and what our next steps are. In the first two years of this study, we developed protocols for how to measure gross motor function called CDD motor and hand function called CDD hand in children and young adults with CDD. Then we collected 132 hand function videos and 107 gross motor videos from families with a child uh, or young adult with CDD of all abilities. Parents and caregivers filmed the motor checklist tasks on their smartphones to show us how their child functioned in their own natural environment. The videos enabled us to refine our protocols and both measures have done well statistically. CDD motor and CDD hand measure small steps in skills that are important for people with movement difficulties and are suitable for children of any ability. We are now going to test the measures in the second stage of our 1 in 200 study, which is the longitudinal phase. We are inviting families to repeat the videos every six months for two years to give longitudinal data and enable us to understand what is happening over time. We aim to collect CDD motor and CDD hand videos near to the time of when you visit your centre of excellence clinic. When you are invited to participate in the longitudinal phase by your COE coordinator, they will give you details about what this phase involves, including this video study. We will then call you to discuss the video study in more detail and organise sending you the motor video materials. For all abilities, seeing you and your child working together to do the tasks will give us very important information. Thank you very much for joining us in the longitudinal phase of our 1 in 200 study. We look forward to meeting you and your child through your video. Thank you. Many families enrolled in the international CDCAL5 database have been US families who have been part of the 1 in 200 study. However, to understand the video measures better, we have also been collecting videos from US families who do not or cannot attend the centers of excellence as well as from families living in many other parts of the world, such as Australia, Germany, and Russia. We would like to express our deepest gratitude to all these families who have so patiently worked with us and helped us to make these video measures fit for purpose in a real clinical trial. We'd also like to thank all the families who have completed questionnaires especially those who have completed a follow-up questionnaire, as these data are all also helping us to design the best measures to describe both communication and sleep. A huge thank you to all of you 
We have really enjoyed working with you and look forward to this continuing into the future as we contact you again for new studies and updated information about your children. Thank you so very much, every one of you. To recap, the longitudinal phase includes in-person visits to one of the CDCAL-5 Centers of Excellence in the United States. But we encourage all CDCAL-5 families from around the world to participate in the study surveys and video study from their home. The success of this important work depends on the participation of our CDCAL-5 community. Together, we are getting CDCAL-5 clinical trial ready.